Hello and welcome to the United Methodist Foundation webinar on the state of the Church of Louisiana across the Louisiana Annual Conference. I'm Chris Spencer and I'm the Development Officer for South Louisiana for the Methodist Foundation. And true to our tagline, we're here, our, tra our tagline, which you'll see behind me, where faith and money come together, we wanted to connect with pastors and church leaders to learn how our churches are faring during this pandemic in terms of three things, their adaptability, their approach to the new world that we are all living in, and then three, their outlook going forward, and to see ways where the foundation can help. Now, if you'll give me a little uh, leeway here, we're gonna skip, I'm actually gonna skip right now to the end for just a moment. The sky is not falling. We heard some great stories from the respondents. Our churches and their people are resilient and they're doing some amazing things that we're gonna share this afternoon with you to reach out to their members and to those in need in their communities during this time of great difficulty and stress. Rob Fairley, the president of our foundation, will join me in a few minutes. If you have questions or comments, we'll have some information at the end of the webinar where you can respond with your questions and contact information as well. And we'll be happy to get back to you. Now, here at the foundation, we want you to know that we are here to serve you and our mission has not changed. We continue to work with churches and their leaders to provide guidance and to assist with stewardship, financial management and plan giving strategies going forward. Like you, we've been working with, an, with adjusted staff schedules, but we always have staff available five days a week, and we're always a phone call or an email away. Now, I know y'all probably don't want to stare at me any longer than you have to, so on to the survey. All right, as I said earlier, the sky is not falling. That's the theme of what we have found from this survey. And we've been re-energized in many ways by the stories that the respondents have told us and their responses, and we'll get to those in a minute. But first, some quick stats and details on the survey itself. We sent the survey to the pastors and church leaders of our 400 plus churches across the conference. And we will receive responses from about one out of every four churches. All districts from around the state have been represented. And we got responses from a full mix of churches, small and large, rural and suburban. Now the survey was divided up into categories. And the first category that we covered was innovation. As you can see, to the question of how has your church adopted new ways to worship that will continue after the shutdown, fully 85% of those who participated in the survey said that their church either adopted new ways or is considering adopting new ways to worship. Now, digging a little deeper, <clears throat> we asked, what has been the most effective change? And we got some very impactful responses. Here are some. As you can see, they all point to technology live streaming, YouTube, online worship, adding multiple ways to connect, all related to technology. And in some cases, we had respondents tell us they were forced to adjust to technology. They were forced to adapt new ways of reaching their people. And we had other churches tell us they had programs in place, but they quickly realized they were nowhere near prepared for what had hit them. We also noted some trends among the responses that we think are very worth sharing with you today. First, adapting to change has allowed churches to connect further and in new ways. One church told us, Zoom has really worked for us. We have about 12 to 15 groups a week meeting regularly and has truly kept us connected and brought back members who moved away in places like Los Angeles, Boston, Chicago, and Orlando. 
Another church leader said, online worship has allowed others to worship with us no matter the distance. It has also brought an awareness to our food bank ministry, which we didn't have an awareness of before. Now, continuing the trend on connecting further, another church leader responded, we are also discovering that there are people, even in other cities and states, who are finding connection with us through these online opportunities. People who want a small group, but can't find it where they live, or people who are homebound for other reasons. Now, Rob's gonna talk in a moment about giving and, our, and the giving trends from our survey. But giving was also a trend noted by respondents about what has been the most effective change. One church said, online giving has been the biggest change for us. Keeping the dedication of tithes and offerings in the service has been crucial. We have seen a huge response to this. Finally, another theme that we noted is that churches have found that more adapting of technology has led to more efficient use of time. Zoom meetings have made our church meetings more effective in our work and usage of time, and we've been able to strengthen relationships through small groups on Zoom, one church told us. Another church said, we have adjusted our services to 45 minutes because we offer four of them on Sunday morning. This has resulted in a crisper, more, more focused time of worship. Another category we surveyed is expenses. expenses. And this slide, we asked, what will change permanently in the future? While many churches don't know what expenses will change in the future, clearly technology expenses are up. It's the largest category noted, where 35% said that technology expenses will increase going forward. Now, here are some comments from the respondents. What do they anticipate going down? Printed materials potentially staff costs. But on the other hand, as you can see, some churches are anticipating adding some staff folks. So there's definitely some movement in their, of their planned expenses as a result of the changes that they've been forced to take on through this pandemic. Now, regarding technology, we have found that many churches did not have the necessary equipment when the shutdown hit to offer their worship services online. So in partnership with Todd Rossnagel from the conference office, the foundation has provided funding for new video equipment so churches can offer online worship. And so far, we funded about 20 churches across the conference. And as these results show, this is an investment that is paying off across Louisiana for our churches. We also ask respondents about their worship experience during the shutdown. No surprise of the churches that responded most have been worshiping via Facebook Live or YouTube or through their existing website or even through Zoom. And it's no surprise that the churches, when asked, told us that they plan to continue to offer those same formats when they resume in-person worship or when we all return to some level of normalcy. We also asked, what effect will a new worship format, format have on your church or what does it have on your church? And as you can see, Regular members and new visitors are attending online. People are enjoying the worship service online and they find that they can access it easily. If you look at the blue chart about, I think right in the middle of the uh, slide, you'll see that 33% said overall attendance has increased in their churches. That is great news, particularly in the time of stress and certainly the uncertainty that we're all facing right now. Regarding engagement, excuse me, uh, let me take a step back. So the responses we got about what effect the new worship format has had. Our physical attendance is down, but we doubled our online attendance. Our online worship allows those who are vulnerable or not ready to come back to stay connected. Again, some great consequences, maybe some unintended, as a result of this pandemic that we're all facing. Now regarding engagement. We asked the question, how are you engaging your congregation other than worship service? Churches continue to engage their members through a mix of traditional methods, like phone calls and direct mail and drive-by check-ins, or delivery of materials or handwritten notes, and non-traditional ways to connect. Things like, efforts like virtual Bible study, virtual devotionals, texting, email. And here are a couple of great responses that we received to this question. Are there other ways your church could reach out to its members? And here are a few more responses that 
we received that were too numerous for us to put on the slide, but we think are pretty important to bring forward for churches to, to know what churches are doing out in the conference to reach out and engage their congregation. One pastor wrote, if someone needed something, I would post it on our church page. And if another person had it, I would pick it up and deliver it to the person in need. And another leader wrote, we have conducted front porch visits while wearing masks and social distancing. One pastor told us he and his staff took a list of their church members and divided it up. And they started calling them weekly for eight weeks. He figured the church was continuing to pay its staff. So this would be a good use of their time. Now, the pastor reported that the first time, members were pleasantly surprised to get the phone call. The second time, they might have been a little suspicious. But by the third time or the fourth time, the members started opening up. They started sharing their concerns and their fears, areas where they need help, places where the pastor and his staff could reach in and have an opportunity to minister to their church members. As a result, online attendance has grown significantly, people are re-engaging with the church, and not surprisingly, giving is up. Their members are feeling more connected because they know their church cares about them and their church wants to hear from them. Now, isn't that what the ministry of the United Methodist Church should be all about? At this time, we're gonna turn it over to Rob. Rob? Thank you, Chris. And thank you folks for listening to us and joining in at this conference. Now let's talk about money. Money is an integral part of the mission here at the foundation, but it's also an integral part of all ministry done by our churches. So we asked the question, how would you characterize your year-to-date giving trends? Might be a little surprising. Notice that just 10% said they were significantly behind. 42% may be slightly behind. The next two columns, 47% said they were on budget or ahead of budget. It's a significant and I think positive response. The Unstuck Group, which is a national consulting firm working with churches, did their own survey. It covered 818 churches across the United States. They found giving had decreased by an average of just 5%. Our people continue to be generous. So we said, how would you anticipate the remainder of the year to be? A natural follow-up? And it gets even better. That significantly behind figure you might have noticed has dropped now down to 8%. 54% are saying they plan to be on budget or a little bit ahead. And that, that shrinking behind uh, number is what I guess got our attention the most. Remember that this is summertime. Miracle December is coming. It always comes. You can count on it this year just as well. Sometimes the stock market will affect how that end of year giving increase happens. And what we normally hear about from the stock market that makes the news is how it's struggling, how it's falling. But here are the facts. In the last 30 days, it's up 6%. In the last 90 days, it's up 9.85%. If the Standard & Poor's were to close at the number that it opened at today, it would be the best July in seven years. If it were to go up just a few points, it would be the best July in a decade. There is hope ahead for the stock market and for the gifts that come from that for our churches. We ask, what methods do you make available to your congregation for giving? Well, no surprise here, the old standards, the tallest column is mail-in checks. You have automatic drafts, the collection plate, the drop-in box, the regular ways. But you know, I think we're probably doing well, not because these methods are so terrific. I think it's probably because we are who we have been afraid we are going to be for the last several years. We are an aging denomination, but an aging denomination produces loyal, old-fashioned people, also in terms of their giving, people who give even in a pandemic. So what methods work best, we ask these churches? Notice, 
Mail-in checks are still pretty high, but they're not the primary number that they were in the 90% a minute ago. So of course they always are gonna continue to work, but notice some of the changes. For example, that little purple bar about two thirds over to the right, that's 9%. That was twice what they anticipate helping in the rest of the year is what they've experienced already. There's beginning to be this change to some of these newer methods. You know, God may be forcing us to upgrade and do things in a modern way. Now, let me point out the scariest bar, in our opinion, and it's that 2% green bar off to the far right. They don't know. How in the world can you address an issue if you don't bother to find out about it, if you don't analyze the figures that you have? How can you address issues that you have, or how can you improve anything if you don't pay attention? Even Jesus in the temple watched people. He watched who gave, how much they gave, and what spirit they gave with. We need to know how our people are giving. We also said, after you return to in-person worship, what methods do you plan to use? Of course, we're gonna do the old fashioned providing a drop box, passing the plate. But notice the three bars to the right, which I find much more exciting, using virtual alternatives over 50%, exploring other alternatives 38% and other, I don't even know what that means, but it means something different. And I think that's good. Here are some of the other responses that we received. We will not return to passing a physical collection plate, but we'll have baskets in place on the way in and out. I guess that's social distancing. Online giving through mobile apps or bill pay are a definite part of our future. One replied they were unsure before we go to the annual campaign, unsure of possibilities. If you're one of those churches that are unsure, let us help, call the foundation. You know, the number one worst, bad, unacceptable excuse that we receive when we ask churches whether or not they engage text to give or one of the other methods is, well, we'd have to pay some fees. Now, there are four vendors that we have knowledge about that we can provide information about. Two of them have no monthly fees. The other two have fees of five or $15. There's a transaction fee with any of them because there has to be a, a transaction when the gift is made. And those average expenses are about 35 cents per transaction. Now, if your donor uses a credit card, there is the always present, no matter if you're buying dinner or going on a trip, credit card charge, which is about 3%. So I'm gonna pose a math question to you. Let's say you take that 3%, and you take the other two things I mentioned and round it up to 4%. So it's gonna cost you 4%. Which is better for the church? Getting 96% of something or 100% of nothing? Fees are a pitiful excuse. If you have questions, call us. In fact, I'll even make you a better deal. If you haven't tried this before and you don't have text to give or some of the other online giving things, Give us a call, let us help you get them established. Try it for a year. If at the end of that year, you can call us and tell us you don't think it was worth it, you lost money doing it, we will cover the expenses that you incur. The foundation is here to show you that online giving or other apps are well worth not only the church's while, but it's their time. Annual campaigns. Well, you know, as all of us probably do, the 28th chapter of Leviticus commands all United Methodist churches to have annual campaigns in the fall. And hopefully as United Methodists, you realize there are only 27 chapters in Leviticus, so I made that up. But it is our tradition. So we're approaching the fall. Are we gonna have an annual campaign? Well, 22% of our churches, our respondents said, yeah, it's gonna be about the same. But more importantly to me, the next three columns 64% plus said, well, yeah, uh, we're gonna have one and we're gonna modify it a little bit. Or it's very different and man, have we got a plan. Or some of them said, it's really gonna be different, but we don't know what we're gonna do. I don't care any of those responses, they're all great. They're gonna have a campaign and they're gonna try something a little bit different. Now, the one that bothers me and the one I truly don't understand is the far one on the right. 
13.27% are not going to have a campaign this year. Why? Why deny the people that attend your church, the people you're leading in developing their faith, why deny them the opportunity to experience the joy in making a commitment to God, fulfilling that commitment, and being blessed by that? You know, we are on a journey of faith. We need to give every member every opportunity to develop their faith. So we also said, what else could the foundation do to help your church? And as you see here, there were a number of responses. Uh, the, the highest bar that you see, 69%, just is the general encouraging generosity. Well, in order to address those issues, we are planning and have developed five webinars. The first one you're observing today. That's reporting on the real facts of the church here in Louisiana. The next one, annual campaigns, and then the encouraging generosity and the end of year giving are all financial oriented. We have some outside speakers that I think you can be very impressed with. Uh, and it's this standard financial thing. But I wanna point your attention to that middle one, aging parents and their financial affairs. Now I'm a baby boomer. I buried my parents but not all that long ago. And in the final years of their life, they needed increasing amounts of help to manage their money, to make their decisions, and to make sure that their assets were going to do after their lifetimes what they wanted them to do. That is a growing need, not only of baby boomers, but of the children of baby boomers as we approach those latter years of our life. So we have worked with a, the state planning attorney who does more than just estate planning actually specializes in helping people like us, people like baby boomers, work with their parents to make sure they've made the right decisions with their money. I really encourage you to make a note of that date, August 20th, and tune in. Like all of these, there's no cost to you, but I think you'll find it very beneficial. So what are the takeaways? Folks, the sky is not falling. Remember, God promises that he'll be there in the future. Nearly half of the churches that responded are at or ahead of their budget. Now, sure, we're facing challenges, and frankly, we're all facing the same challenges, but we're facing it together. And those challenges, as they often do, actually give us opportunity. They give us opportunities for more engagement with people. They give us opportunities for more giving. So as always, let's be guided by the word. In Philippians, we read, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Chris? Thank you, Rob. Timeless words from the Apostle Paul, who, as we understand when he wrote the book of Philippians, was in a time of great distress, probably awaiting his execution and, and encouraging those around him despite the circumstances he was in and despite the uncertainty, not unlike the times that we're in right now. As I said earlier, We'd have a slide for any questions or comments that you may have that are generated by today's webinar. And here is our contact information for Rob and for me, and also the third member of our development team, Bob Carroll, who covers North Louisiana from our development office for us. You can see our email addresses there, but you can also call anytime, or you can go on our website. And there's a spot on our website where you can click and ask questions and submit and it will come to us. I also wanna take one step back and mention that the webinars that Rob just mentioned are on our website and you can register for them through our website for those dates. And as Rob said, please no note those dates on your calendar and we are looking forward for the opportunity to serve you. We hope the information today has been helpful. We hope it will benefit you and your church going forward. And as to reiterate, as I said earlier, we are here to serve you however we can. God bless and have a great rest of your day.